This is Our Voices. I'm Mario Trimble. In order to be a place where everyone in our community feels valued and connected, we first have to ensure that everyone believes they belong. These are Our Voices, a joint podcast production from the Colorado and Denver Bar Association's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusivity Joint Steering Committee. Our Voices shines a light on the unique stories, experiences, and backgrounds of our member leaders so that we can help each other walk together. Colorado Supreme Court Justice Monica Marquez has dedicated her life to service. Raised in Grand Junction, Colorado, Justice Marquez was appointed to the Colorado Supreme Court by Governor Bill Ritter Jr. in 2010 after serving as the Deputy Attorney General over the State Services Section, among other roles, within the Colorado AG's office, following a very successful career in private practice, in commercial litigation, and employment law. Her list of accolades and accomplishments is too long to list. One constant theme of her career and her life, though, has been service to others. From her first job as a volunteer school teacher through Jesuit Volunteer Corps, to her many efforts in the areas of attorney well-being, Diversity, equity, and inclusion, the desire to do good works for the betterment of others has guided her like a North Star. Justice Marquez sat down with our own Mallory Revel and Linda Moss to discuss her path to the bench, her experiences as a Colorado Supreme Court Justice, and how she continues to give back to the Colorado legal community, both in the courtroom and beyond. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Our Voices. I'm Mallory Revel, a criminal defense attorney with Foster Graham, Milstein, and Kalisher, and I'm here with my co-host. I'm Linda Moss. I'm a family law attorney with Sederosh Smith and Schellenberger. And we are thrilled to be here with Justice Monica Marquez today. Thank you so much for joining us, Justice Marquez. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an amazing project that you're doing, and I'm so delighted to be here and invited to participate. Well, thank you. We love compliments. <laughs> what a wonderful way to start this. <laughs> actually, so, I actually listen to these when I walk my dog at night. So oh, I, I load yay. them as they come on. And um, it's wonderful to hear about members of our community. So it's, oh, it's that, great. That makes the whole, yeah, <laughs> the whole so project exciting. work. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Marquez listens to our podcast. I do. I seriously, I do. They're all great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We're so happy that you're here. So let's jump right in today. We're going to talk about who who you were, who you are, and who you're going to be. So let's go back, way back when, and start with who were you? So La Familia Marquez uh, comes from the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado, uh, eight or nine generations going back. And, um, you know, when Colorado was still a territory and probably even when Colorado was, that chunk of Colorado was still part of Mexico. Mexico, pardon me. And um, I think uh, ranchers, uh, shepherds, uh, cowboys um, lived a really hard scrabble life. That's where my dad was born in a little town called Las Mesitas. Um, He grew up uh, kind of all over Colorado and Nebraska and Wyoming because my grandfather was part of the Bureau of Land Management and was involved Mm. in these infrastructure projects, highways and dams in the 1950s. And somewhere along the way, he happened to spend his senior year of high school in a little town in Oklahoma called Anadarko, where he met my mother, Cherry Beverage. Yes, that is her name. And um, they dated super briefly. My mom was head over heels. He was like, "Mm." (laughs) (laughs) okay. (laughs) Well, so he had other plans. And uh, right after high school, he actually entered the seminary and became a Benedictine monk. So he entered the religious life. And uh, lucky for me, uh, he changed his mind eventually about that. (laughs) And um, otherwise, we wouldn't be having this podcast today. Uh Uh, But somewhere along the way, he changed his mind. He decided that was not the the life for him. He came out, I think, right at the height of Vietnam and figured he was going to get drafted. So rather than be drafted, he chose his branch and wound up in the Air Force. His younger sister, who was in the same class as my mother, Somehow they had managed to stay in touch. In the meantime, my mother had moved to Denver and became a grade school teacher. 
and she finds out that Lorenzo <laughs> was back on the market uh. <laughs> and reached out to him, somehow reconnected. They started corresponding while he was in basic training. And um, one thing led to another, and they rekindled that relationship. And yeah, um, from there, when dad emerged from the Air Force, I was actually born in a barracks hospital in Austin, Texas. Uh, and when he got out of the Air Force, he decided to bring the family back to Colorado. And he started out in the San Luis Valley and looked for a job and couldn't find one. And eventually, we came back to Grand Junction, where he landed with Colorado Rural Legal Services. So my sister, who's yeah, 15 months younger than I am, and I grew up in the Grand Junction area doing all the Grand Junction things. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a wonderful place to grow up. What are all of the Grand Junction things, aside from wineries? Um, oh, so <laughs> now on that point, um, that was not a thing back oh, okay. in the 70s or 80s. In fact, that just sort of started. I worked the peach orchards in Palisade, like a lot of kids oh, cool. in high school. Drove tractors, picked peaches in the summers. Hmm. And I remember in whatever that would have been, you know, the mid-80s, uh, there were a couple of farmers that were ripping out their peach orchards and planting vineyards, and all the farmers were kind of laughing at them, thinking, you guys are nuts. And apparently the vineyards have had the last laugh. Uh-huh. <laughs> a generation later, um, you know, it's it's actually its own little bustling vineyard industry, but that was not the case in the 1980s. I mean, Grand Junction's grown a lot. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of hiking, camping, fishing on the Grand Mesa. I played Little League. Um, you know, it was a very small town. It was a great wonderful place to grow up and we really hung out in a largely hispanic sub-community of town we went to mass in spanish um all of the families that we ran around with had hispanic surnames cruz paca lucero rodriguez uh we went uh my dad ran a mariachi choir at our local church and so everybody was expected to participate and my sister sang, my mom sang, I dad played guitar and I played the trumpet and yeah, it was a whole family affair. So That's um, awesome. Yeah, it was a small town. It was a great like I said, it was a wonderful place to grow up. So you grew up in Grand Junction. At what point did you decide that it was time to leave Grand Junction? So my one of the early sort of life changing events for me was um in high school. My sophomore year, I was sitting in Spanish class one day and heard an announcement over the phone or over the intercom. Uh, anybody who's interested in this uh, summer program as an exchange student in Germany, come down to the counselor's office. Mm. And I was curious, well, I'll go check it out. So I went down to the counselor's office and turns out um, the, the good news was this was actually a scholarship. So that was a huge incentive. Mm-hmm. The um, the twist, though, was it wasn't just for the summer. It was for an entire year. And then the double twist was that the application was due literally the next morning. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my gosh, I have no idea. I ran up to the German teacher. I wasn't even taking German at the time. I scooped up a bunch of magazines and <laughs> went home and stayed up all night like filling out this application. Did you have to fill out the application in German? <laughs> No, uh, but it was, you know, this is old school. This is handwritten kind uh-huh. of thing. And I had to submit... a some hundred word essay about the greatest challenge facing U.S. West German relations. And this will tell you how clueless I was. God. (laughs) Um, I was like, U.S. West German relations? Does that mean there's like maybe an East Germany? (laughs) I mean, I seriously, I had no clue. So I threw something together. I don't remember now what. My parents were like, look, this is a long shot. This is uh, this was a scholarship that was sponsored by the United States Congress and the German Bundestag. So the United States Congress sponsors 435 students from across the country wow. and sends them over to Germany, and Germany sends a comparable number of students over to the United States. So, I don't know, six or eight weeks later, I actually get a letter that I'm a finalist. And it was a big deal to go to this this finalist interview. So I we had to get up and over the mountains to Denver, which back in the day, you know, that was like a journey. It was oh, yeah. an epic thing, you yeah. know. Um, and so being a Latino family, the whole family pedals in the car, and we all go over the mountains and land in Denver. My mom went out of her way to buy me my very first suit. Oh. And um, I just remember feeling terrified and really out of my league Um, because I was up against all these kids from the front range and at one point during the interview there were two parts to it one was 
uh, I had to sit there at a long table in front of a whole bunch of grown-ups and answer a bunch of questions. And sure. then the second part was this group interview, which on the surface was to put together a presentation. Uh, they put all the kids together in the room. They say, hey, you've just landed in Germany. Let's have you come up with a presentation telling these German high school students about what life is like in the United States. Um, really what's going on is they're trying to test student interaction, like how, how do the kids mm-hmm. get along, what are the kind of group dynamics, that sort of thing. Of course, I didn't yeah, realize sure. that as a 15-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember sitting there, and one of the front-range kids who just seemed so sophisticated came from some big school over here in Denver, and he, um, he reaches into his jacket pocket, and he whips out a notebook, and he whips out a gold pen, and he starts taking <laughs> notes, and he starts, like, just <laughs> organizing things, right? Okay, guys, we're going to do this and that and the other. And, and I remember just sitting there terrified. I was a very shy, very reserved kid. And at some point in that process, I paused and told myself, like, if you don't speak up mm. right now, um, this opportunity is going to pass you by. Yeah. And the thing that also frustrated me about the conversation as it was evolving was it was describing a picture of American life that was not my mm. experience. Yeah. And I wanted to sort of add my voice to that conversation. And I said, hey, you know, here's what my life looks like. Here's what my family looks like. And I started describing my grandparents in New Mexico and, um, you know, my family roots and so forth. I just sort of tried to lend my voice to the conversation. And it was this really, I mean, I look back and I think it was a really critical act of courage as a 15-year-old. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, to step up and do that. And I then found out some point later that I won the scholarship. So I get on this plane at age 16 terrified (laughs) um and you know i also think about the courage my parents had Mm -hmm. to send their 16 year old off for an entire year especially in an era when there was no internet there was no email yeah they couldn't zoom you every night no i grew up in the time of internet and my mom would have had a heart attack (laughs) yeah (laughs) so send me off on this plane and and it was it was utterly life-changing so I landed with this family uh, in this little teeny tiny town called Ledmonta, and in that sense, it was comparable to Grand Junction, mm. probably even smaller, truthfully. And this family that I wound up with, the Cromers, uh, honestly, we had nothing in common. <laughs> and yet, they were so amazing. They worked so hard to try to make it work, you know. So my mm-hmm. host father. Uh, we bumbled our, I mean, I knew basically zero German. They knew basically zero English. Um, he understood that I played trumpet and figured out that, oh, I can hook her up, her up with this youth orchestra down the street. Oh, cool. So I started playing trumpet with this youth orchestra. I'm not sure the mariachi skills translated. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a start, right? Mm-hmm. And then I learned how to play soccer, which is obviously a big deal mm-hmm. over there. I'd never been exposed to that in Grand Junction. Um and at the same time, I, as again, I spoke enough German to sort of count to 10 and find my way to the restroom and, um, you know, ask some very simple questions. And I got thrown into class doing trigonometry and biology and chemistry and um, history yeah. and literature and religion and music. And um, everything was auf Deutsch. Yeah. And uh, the exhaustion factor of that was so intense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were, I mean, countless days that I just came home and was like, I, I can't do this. I want to go home. Mm. I want to be home in time for homecoming. <laughs> the Grand Junction High School Tiger football team is about to win the state championship. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, I'm missing out on my Aww. junior year, you know. So I, I got really homesick and yeah. um, frustrated. And it probably wasn't until... I got past Christmas of that year when I f- when finally started to get a grasp for the language. And then it was like this incredible immersion experience. Um, and when I t- came back, I uh, was so fluent that my fellow classmates back at Grand Junction High School, these incoming Germans, actually mistook me for a fellow German. Nice. Um, so that's when I knew... I had actually mastered the language. Yeah. I'm still. I'm not nearly as fluent as I used to be, and plus my vocabulary was stuck in like 1985, so <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't necessarily be as fluent today. But it was really powerful. 
and it certainly changed my my view of the world. Well, and so from what you were saying, that was three to four months of exhaustion before you really caught the language? Um, more like July to Christmas. So okay. probably fully Oof. half of the experience. Gosh, that, yeah. Yeah. And you That's still intense. stay in touch with that family that you stayed with, don't you? I do. So 35 years later, we are still very tight. I am I actually communicate them, with them routinely on WhatsApp now. I uh-huh. had three siblings, two parents. Um, we've been back and forth any number of times. And in the summer of 2019, for the first time, I was able to take my parents to this little town in Ledmata and show them all around show them the school, show them the church where I played, you know, the youth orchestra. Mm-hmm. Uh, m- frankly, very little had changed <laughs> in, their, in their little town. Um, and it was this incredible reunion. And to think about the relationships that I entered at, as a 15, 16-year-old and how they're playing out as a 50-year-old mm-hmm. uh, is, is just amazing. It's just amazing how life turns out it's so special we have a kind of a theme going of the things that you can say and you can do that you have no idea have such an impact on the trajectory of someone else's life however small or big I mean opening your home to someone for that long is on the bigger end of commitment I would say yeah Yeah. but (laughs) even just a small you know five minute interaction can just change someone's life which is so powerful and the thing that's kind of cool about that is um they didn't actually sign up to be host parents for a year (laughs) they had some neighbor friends who were really connected with up with people the music program uh and through that group they essentially only signed on to initially have me for four weeks (laughs) as part of a language camp uh, life took a weird turn and they ended up hanging on to me for the whole year, which I'm forever grateful for. But yeah, just, I mean, it was kind of random that we were ever paired together and it ended up being one of the richest relationships of my life. Mm, that's yeah. so special. It's amazing. So you go to Germany for a year, you come back, you're fluent in German, you're basically a German person. So then what? So I go off to Stanford. Um, I want to say in my junior year, I was hoping to find an opportunity to get back to Germany. Mm. And the only program that Stanford had available at the time was in Berlin. That sounds very exciting today. Um, In the late 80s, Mm -hmm. that actually was not terribly exciting to me. I had been there in the mid-80s, and it's very removed. It was very drab and gray and isolated from the rest of uh, Western Europe. So... I wasn't super jazzed about the program, but I was able to pair it with a spring semester program in Krakow, Poland. And I was, at the time, very interested in uh, East-West relations. The opportunity to go to Poland somewhere off the beaten path was kind of cool. So I go back there, or I sign up to go back there. And weeks before I arrive, just a couple of weeks before I arrive, the Berlin Wall falls which made it, as a political science major, an incredible yeah. experience, particularly one who speaks fluent German. Yeah. So the Stanford program tends to pair people with you know, host families. But in my case, because I was fluent, they just chucked me in this uh-huh. Turkish neighborhood a couple blocks from the wall and set me loose and said, go have fun, you know? Um, <laughs> go live some and, history. Yeah, literally, and just walk out your door and you're, you're part of this. Pro- I mean, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall was not a single day. It was a multi-month evolution um, and and revolution, if you will. So to be part of that and to sort of experience that political moment was incredibly powerful. So I get through all that. Um, the Poland piece was fascinating as well. Um, wild stories about my time in Poland, <laughs> including all kinds of shortages. You know, you'd see a line like, what is that uh, for? Oh, maybe toilet paper. Let's go do that. I mean, now we think about that in COVID era. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I get back from all of that. And as I was graduating, I, I decided that I wanted to do a Peace Corps type experience. Mm. And I had been overseas at this point a couple of times. So yeah. I thought, well, let me look domestically for a similar opportunity. And I landed on the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. So the JVC is a Peace Corps style of uh, service experience. Um, I wind up in uh, Camden, New Jersey, and even that was sort of a random accident. I told them I wanted to teach 
Uh, by the way, my mother had been a public school teacher for mm. years and years. And Why did she teach? She taught grade school. Okay. So for 30-some years, she taught hundreds of children how to read and has made such an impact in her own way um, in her life. So, and the joke was always, uh, the two things I know I never, I don't want to be as a kid was a teacher and a lawyer, and then I became a teacher <laughs> and I became a lawyer. So, I so think, thanks, mom, thanks, dad. Um, I wasn't willing to admit their influence on me, but obviously they had tremendous influence on me. Um, so, as I'm entering this program, I, I asked for a teaching opportunity, and they set me up with a boys' school in. Manhattan, or no, I'm sorry, Brooklyn. Um, I was super excited about this. I was running around telling all my friends, oh, I'm going off to New York City. This is really exciting. Uh, and then the day before graduation, I get a call from the Monsignor who ran that school who said, oh, gosh, I just got around to looking at your application. Um, you look amazing, but we really wanted to have a male teacher for this math program next year. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, <Well wait. laughs> I know. Right. Um, I, I mean, I was just stunned. I, yeah. uh, I, I had never had an experience like that, but all of a sudden this job that I thought I had, I didn't have. So I reached back out to JVC headquarters. And at that point, uh, we're now maybe a month ish, six weeks before everybody's supposed to arrive. And all that was left was, if I wanted to teach, was this well third grade spot in Camden, New Jersey? I'm like, I have not no idea where Camden quite is. White New York, New York City. City. No, <laughs> no, it's not. It's very much not New York City. It's very much not New York City. So, I had I had never heard of Camden. I had no idea where it was. Um, I pulled this giant Rand McNally map out from under my bed and like flipped through it, and it's like, oh, there it is across the river from Philadelphia. Yeah, it's in the Philly part of New Jersey. <laughs> yes, it is literally across the river from Philly. Yeah. But it is a world and universe away from Philadelphia, for sure. So that Jesuit volunteer career experience was so intense. Um, there were six volunteers. We were all involved in youth-related programming. So uh, there were two, two of us who worked with daycare centers, two who worked as classroom teachers, and two who worked as after-school uh, programs, sports, music, that kind of thing but we were scattered across the city. So we lived in this beat up old row house that was like teeming with mice and roaches. Mm. Um, You got the housing, as modest as it was. You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. I wasn't gonna show you a picture of this house because it was was pretty scary. Uh, One of my roommates, as we drove up, as we drove up on the first day, she burst into tears. She was from Wisconsin and she just burst into tears. And I thought, oh my God, what have we gotten ourselves into? So you, you, you got the housing, you got a bus pass to get back and forth to work and you were given $70 a month for food, which we pooled. Mm-hmm. And then everything else came out of your salary, which was $85 a month. So, um, so you're you were, living large? Living large, yes. $85 Oof. needed to cover your clothing, your toiletries, your entertainment, um, you know, all, anything else. Um, so Oof. you learn really quickly yeah. uh, how to live hand to mouth and how to yeah. live um, stretching a dollar. Uh, you watch every penny. Um, that's part of the theme of the program is simple lifestyle, social justice, spirituality, and community, and you are living it in a true immersion experience. So I taught at this little tiny school called St. Bartholomew in third grade. Um, I was the only non-black person, you know, around for miles. And I will say that's a really powerful experience Mm. as well, uh, and if it was almost like being an exchange student again mm-hmm. in many ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I drew from a lot of those exchange student experiences and skills to sort of make my way in what to me was a really foreign, urban, intense uh, environment. Mm-hmm. So I taught my kids a little Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um you know, they they taught me all kinds. They taught me all kinds of dance moves. I don't know that I was ever really good. <laughs> um, taught me how to turn double Dutch. Um, oh. uh, I I just I went to some amazing church 
experiences that mm-hmm. were different than my Catholic experiences. Um, so it, it, anyway, the whole thing was intense. It was hard. I, w- I wanted to quit. <laughs> it was very much like the exchange student year. But when you, one of the turning points that year was uh, I, we were told that we we're going to have a Christmas pageant. And I drew from my own Catholic grade school experiences about Christmas pageant. And when I was in third grade, we had to do uh, a recitation of Twas the Night Before Christmas and had to memorize the poem and everything. I thought, okay, let's turn this into Camden style. So my roommate and I basically wrote a rap based on the Gospel of Luke called Yo, Twas the Night. And <laughs> That's amazing. My kids, uh, and this will date me too, because this is what, 1991, so they all wore like MC Hammer shades and <laughs> um, tinsel for you know halos and whatnot, but we had the whole Christmas story in rap form, and my kids just did this bang-up job <laughs> at, the, at the pageant, and it was this moment where I felt like I had bridged that gap mm-hmm. yeah. as an exchange student culturally, and the parents who, God bless them, you know, had entrusted their kids with this 22-year-old know-nothing from Grand Junction, Colorado, uh-huh. um, with the education of their children, suddenly started to respect at least what I was attempting to do. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that bonded me with the parents in, in ways that brought us together. From, I, from that moment on, I fell in love with teaching, and I ended up sticking around for another couple of years. Um, and you can't live in an environment like that for three-ish years and not be fundamentally and profoundly changed. Um, JVC has a mantra called, you know, ruined for life. And I am definitely ruined for life by that experience. It has changed how I view the world. It certainly impacts how I approach my work as a judge. Um, how I view the problems that are we face as a society. Um, it definitely plays into all of that for me. Wow, that's really powerful. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like the majority of your young adult educational experience was um, very focused on and heavily impacted by travel. Did that factor into your eventual decision to go to law school? If there's a running theme um, it's probably twofold one is based on faith of course and I think I, you could probably sort of see the narrative thread going back to even to my father right mm-hmm. and his his entry into religious life and kind of that influence um, the other is one about following the the less well-worn path taking what were in the end calculated risks but it definitely heading in a different direction and and deliberately choosing to do something different and a little bit out of the ordinary. Some of those things were adventurous. Uh, Some of those things were incredibly challenging. Um, But yeah, from there, I went across the river to Philadelphia and I worked as a community organizer. And my experiences there also profoundly affected how I think about society's ills. there were a number of people that I worked with, including a man named Tyrone Reed, who I just love and adore, who I felt so frustrated for him that uh, these folks who cared so passionately about their communities and wanted to do whatever they could to make their lives for their community members better, but they weren't heard because they didn't have the education, they didn't have the degrees behind their name, they didn't have the stature to be heard by the powers that be in Philadelphia at that time. And sort of a combination of seeing the challenges that my children faced in Camden and uh, my community members in Philadelphia, I decided I can use my privilege to go back to school, earn a law degree, and try to help communities like this and be a voice for communities like these. So that honestly was kind of the motivation, um, mostly born of that educator experience and wanting to improve the lives of the kids who I got to see in my classroom all the time. So moving into becoming a lawyer, 
what did that tangibly look like being a voice for a community so i entered law school as i said um wanting to be a kid lawyer having this vague idea of what a kid like not really fully understand what that was going to mean and the um the really sort of disappointing piece for me was uh, i wound up at yale which was I'm sorry. How Wound does one? Up. I let it go okay, earlier sorry. when you said, and then I went off to Stanford and just kind of went <laughs> yeah, on, and right? I let that go. But how does one wind up at Yale? I had two really good friends at Stanford. We were all RAs together in my senior year. Um, both of them went off to law school right away. Uh, one of them uh, – since has come out as gay. The other was a fellow Latina. Um, the Latina scored a perfect score on her LSAT. Okay, and she wound oh, up at, at uh, Chicago, I think. Wow. And then um, the other guy who ended up being gay, uh, he's, I think he missed like one question. Oh um, my gosh. gosh. And so I was so intimidated by my yeah. two best buds because they yeah. were just so like ridiculously brilliant and everything. And they go off to Chicago and to Columbia. And it was the two of them that said, when I started talking about law school, one of them handed me this book of you know top 15 law schools and said, Monica, I want you to apply for these top tier schools. Read this book, figure out which ones you want to apply to and I want you to apply. And I, I was like, oh, but I can't, I, no, I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> not me. Um, and he said, you got to, you have to do this. Like, he just insisted that I do it. And uh, I'm forever grateful that he pushed me to do that. The other thing that happened was, um, as you can imagine, it cost a little money to apply to law school. Yeah. And uh, in the situation with Yale, as I recall, it was something like 65 bucks to send in that application. Well, I'm making 85 bucks a month. That is one heck of a, an expensive yeah. pow- Powerball ticket. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> as I call it. So, uh, what ended up happening was somehow I found out that they might be willing to waive the application fee if I had a letter from JVC explaining my financial circumstances. Mm. And I got somebody from JVC to write a letter, and they waived the application fee. And so that Powerball ticket went from sixty-five bucks down to twenty-nine cents, which is the cost of a stamp. Mm right for me to mail it in at that time and um i think a lot about that today when i think about trying to remove hurdles for Mm -hmm. diverse uh potential law students getting them into law school what like i wouldn't blink about spending 65 dollars today i probably spent 65 bucks on lunch for two you know Uh uh-huh and it was an insurmountable hurdle yeah. mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah. And um, it's, it's caused me to stop and think about what are these things that don't appear to be hurdles to me, but it might be a huge hurdle to others, and how can we remove those? I credit the JVC experience. Um, I, I think that really enhanced my application because mm-hmm. it was so unique. Uh, and I, that was kind of the basis of yeah, my personal powerful essay. powerful story. Yeah. Um, and so I was, anyway, I was, thrilled to be there it was an amazing experience it was also incredibly lonely um mm. i think that that i was experiencing what we would now label today as imposter syndrome mm-hmm. in a huge huge way walking down the halls of that building i mean it's like hogwarts i don't it, seriously it is like hogwarts that's and, how i imagine it i'm uh, glad that that's real <laughs> it is literally like hogwarts and walking down these halls and seeing these oiled painting portraits of famous, you know, people who've gone on to become presidents and chief justices of the United States Supreme Court and senators and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking back to that interview experience at age 15. I am so out of my league. What am I doing here? <laughs> who let me in, you know? Um, and to think about um, at some point during my 1L year, I realized like all these people who are around me right now are going to grow up and do really amazing things like my classmate Cory Booker for example who I met actually the first day freshman year at Stanford he and I were standing in line together 
registering for classes. So wow. Made, oh, I love this. <laughs> made, made buds with him on day one, and he ended up dating my roommate for a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then I bump into him again the night before law school. Uh, I walked into a restaurant in New Haven. I don't know Seoul. I, like, I've spent every penny getting from Philadelphia to New Haven. Walk into some cheap restaurant, and from the back, I hear this, hey, Monica. I'm like, oh, my God, who knows me? <laughs> right? <laughs> I roll around. It's like Corey Bucker. That's insane. And so what are you doing here in New Haven? And so what are you doing here in New Haven? I've seen you in a couple, three years. He'd gone off to um, be a Rhodes Scholar and uh, wound up at Yale, and I said, I'm starting law school again. So first day of law school, he ends up introducing me to uh, two folks who ended up being my very, very best friends in law school. Actually, one of them ended up being my girlfriend for the next four years. Oh, um, well. <laughs> So, yeah. That's I amazing. Mean, again, like just the way lives kind of intersect, flowing in and out. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So after law school, we could spend way more time I know, on law I'm school. Sorry, I should... <laughs> we could spend so much time well, in law school. Before we go to after okay. law school, um, what, I guess, was your law school experience, like, aside from intimidating walking through the halls of Hogwarts? I'm so grateful to Corey for introducing me to those two folks because um, Todd and, and Kathy and then this uh, cohort mm-hmm. of buddies, we became a softball team nice. <laughs> during first year, first semester. Um, that group of folks um, I would go to war for, I would take bullet for, um, they helped me survive that whole experience. Uh, we played this intramural league um, fall and spring every year. It seemed to always boil down to us in the med school um, <laughs> for the championship. Uh, but those guys became my very, very best friends. And I actually, um, as we were graduating and we had the class photo done, we all got our uniforms on and got the photographer to take a team photo of us Aww. wearing our oh, uniform. Oh, that's awesome. And I have this photograph of the law school softball team in chambers um, uh, because they're that special to me. So that's a really honor. cool. Yeah. So I, that's how I survived. Um, you know, it was an intimidating place. You, I sort of wound my way through. I discovered that I didn't enjoy being a kid lawyer. I did some mm. uh, a law school clinic uh, mm-hmm. where I represented both children and parents in dependency and neglect cases uh, and learned that that wasn't what I wanted to do. But it ended up sending me down a criminal defense path because mm-hmm. I had a juvenile who I represented in a yeah. criminal matter, discovered criminal law, got my uh, got very excited about that, wound up spending one summer splitting between Dave Scram and Stubbs here in Denver and the Equal Justice Initiative held, uh, headed up by Brian Stevenson down in Montgomery, Alabama. Wow. So that was a little head shaking. Um, wow. So yeah, I did even you know death penalty post-conviction defense work briefly. Um, learned that that was a little too intense. Yeah, um, that's high stake stuff. Yeah, and thank God there are people out there like Brian Stevenson and who do that work. Um, but I also figured out that that wasn't quite for me either. Yeah. So it wasn't until I got to my clerkships that I had a chance to taste, you know, a whole different variety of of different issues. And I probably that's where I learned that I'd be that I'm just a complete law geek. I like it all. <laughs> I'm fascinated by all of it. And I, looking back, I'm not terribly surprised that that's having come full circle Mm -hmm. back into the judicial world. So let's touch on your journey to the bench and what that looked like and where you are now. Um, Very briefly, I spent two years clerking, one in federal district court in Massachusetts, and then I finally made my way back to Colorado and clerked for Judge David Ebell in the Tenth Circuit. I then spent a couple years at Home Roberts and Owen doing general commercial litigation um, really enjoyed that experience, learned a lot, uh, made some uh, great memories and great worked with some great partners there, um, and then shifted over to the Attorney General's office under Ken Salazar, where I started doing criminal appeals. And then the big breakthrough for me was this redistricting litigation that took place in 2003 that spawned a whole suite of cases that lasted for the next five years. 
I won't get into that long story <laughs> since we're approaching redistricting again. Um, and uh, that sent me over to the public officials unit of the attorney general's office where I got to do just some super fun work for the next eight, nine years and then joined the bench in 2010. What has the bench been like for you? So being on the Colorado Supreme Court is, is it, for one, it's an amazing job. Let me, let me just start there. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of surprising things about it. One, I think people think, you are so powerful. You are a Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. The reality is you're one vote of seven. And in every single case, what you think, frankly, doesn't matter unless you can convince at least three of your colleagues to go along with you. And so it is this constant uh, process of working together and trying to persuade each other how to resolve a particular case. And Chief Justice Boatwright likes to joke that it's like being married to six other people. You know, they, they you didn't choose them, and frankly, <laughs> you know what, they didn't choose you either. So, uh, and yet, we don't get to divide up the cases. There are piles of cases, like this is your pile of cases, this is your pile of cases, get them done. Everybody has to vote on every single case, and that is, is challenging because inevitably you're going to disagree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And navigating that constant disagreement yeah. um, is tricky. It's tricky. You certainly cannot take anything personally. Um, you can't get upset that you know you emerged from conference and things didn't go your way. Like you cannot take that. I mean, you would implode if you did. Yeah. So um, you really have to sort of compartmentalize those conversations and just realize, you know, that's about the merits of a case it has nothing to do with, mm -hmm. you know, how we interact. That said, you know, you're working with six different people in a really, really close environment. Everybody has different work styles. Everybody has different weird habits and, you know, <laughs> things that we all drive each other just a tiny bit crazy uh -huh. um, in a good way. Uh, and... I'm just, I'm super grateful for the many iterations of the court that I've had the opportunity to work with. I've sat basically in every chair around mm -hmm. the table at this point. And in fact, with Chief Justice Coates' departure, everybody that I started with is now gone. Mm -hmm. I have a whole new set of colleagues, which is pretty amazing. Super cheesy question. Sure. What is your favorite part of being on the Colorado Supreme Court? My favorite part of being on the Supreme Court, um, the real truthful answer to that is uh, what I said a few minutes ago. When I clerked, I discovered that I am a true law geek. I mm -hmm. really love it all. And being a judge is the one remaining part of this profession where you really get to be a generalist. I think generally at this point, the profession has become so specialized. You specialize in criminal defense or divorces or construction litigation or mm -hmm. insurance. Um, I get to bounce around between all of those things and on any given day handle a child welfare matter and a criminal, you know, a murder appeal and an insurance case and a water case and some sexy constitutional issue. <laughs> Um, and that's before noon, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> and that, that is just, it's very energizing. Um, it's, you're constantly learning. Uh, you're never going to master all of it. Uh, every time you pick up a new case, there's something cool and interesting about it. And I think what's especially neat about, about being about, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court is because our docket is largely cert driven, mm -hmm. we get to pick and choose the handful of cases that we're going to actually deal with. We spend a lot of time behind the scenes sifting through that big pile, mm -hmm. but the ones that we choose for merits resolution are always the really gnarly cases with really terrific arguments of both sides that could go either way. Mm -hmm. Did all the justices work remotely during COVID? Yeah. I'm just picturing a Zoom call of just <laughs> all the justices. Some of the justices continue to come in. It's sort of dependent on what your home situation was like. And if, if it was chaotic and you had a bunch of kids and sometimes moving to the office was actually a respite, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am lucky enough that I actually have a, a really nice home office. So I kind of bounce back and forth. We 
continue to meet every Thursday for conference in person. Mm -hmm. We moved out of our regular conference room into this giant, uh, the, the rules committee room which is this huge room with big high ceilings and we could spread 10 mm-hmm. feet apart and wear yeah. masks and all of that. So we were able to keep it safe. Um, but I think being in person at least that one half day a week uh, helped maintain continuity and keep things rolling. And frankly, we just had so many, uh, not just cases to deal with, but policy issues and mm-hmm. uh, COVID-related just administration of the courts that we had to deal with over the last year that meeting in person was almost necessary yeah yeah i mean just in the court system there were so many challenges Absolutely. i mean oh, we yeah. wrote so many briefs just about COVID issues and speedy trial and all those things there's no easy answers to it there mm-hmm. are no easy answers to those issues and we're yeah. still grappling with that we're going to be for a while for a long time yeah um before we move on to who you're going to be i'm just curious um as to what you were speaking about before kind of maintaining collegiality with your colleagues because it's it's not optional and you absolutely have to not only work around each other but work collaboratively sort of on all cases and so i'm curious in um, kind of finer detail what that looks like for you how how do those discussions go about and then what happens after the discussions when you have to continue being colleagues it's a great question um, everything at our court operates in order of seniority basically and so that seniority provides a number of interesting guardrails both for processes for um, the order of discussion that kind of thing so we literally sit around a table the chief justice at the head, and we sit in senior order. And um, normally, uh, seniority would operate as a rule of, you know, I get to outrank you if I'm more senior than you. With respect to conference conversations, though, we actually operate by rule of juniority. So that means that the baby justice has to go first. And when you're new to the court, being the baby justice and having to go first at conferences a very intimidating Ooh. thing. <laughs> you have to open your mouth and kind of lay your cards out on the table yeah. before anybody else has. And yeah. uh, it forces you to be very prepared, but it also gives you the opportunity to shape the conversation and say, I would mm. affirm, I would reverse. Here are the key issues that I see in a case. It's great training. Yeah, training. You can't yeah. just say, I agree with so-and-so. Right. So, right, right. And by the time you're sitting in my chair, I, I have that luxury, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, I echo so-and-so's so, comments. Yep. It, it, yes, yes. Um, but so we work our way up the table, and it's a very orderly discussion, yeah. right? And it ensures that every person at the table gets to say their piece. Sometimes, once you make your way around the table, there might be a little bit more back and forth, or I might question somebody for clarification about their vote, so I fully understand it. One wonderful evolution that I have seen during my time has been. Uh, richer and longer conversations Hmm. about the cases as we work our way around the table. And that is valuable because it's an investment of time up front to really make sure that each of us at the table understands the full position of everybody before you go off and write. Hmm. So if if you go too quick around the table and then you send somebody off to write, and somebody spends a lot of time putting together a draft and they circulate it and then it turns out, oh, I didn't fully capture the majority opinion or somebody flips, um, you have just wasted yeah. weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of time. And so I think we've learned over the last, in my time, to invest that time up front. Yes, inevitably you're going to disagree. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of our lovely traditions is after we have conference every Thursday, we go to lunch. Uh, that's been a little trickier during COVID, and for a while sure. we just stopped that altogether. Sure. Now we've been bringing in takeout and um, eating in the room, but uh, it's an opportunity to just lay down arms and talk about the Broncos or talk yeah. about your kids or where you're going on vacation someday when this pandemic ends. Um, but it's, you know, it, it is, it's a very um, unique relationship. Uh, you develop a bond that um, is unlike any other work environment mm-hmm. that I've ever experienced, for sure. 
do any nerdy lawyers come up to you when you're at lunch and be like, oh my gosh, oh my you're gosh. the Supreme Court justices. Um, yes, that does happen sometimes. <laughs> it's awkward. You are a celebrity. <laughs> well, you know, there's a huge downside to that because you never get to take the cape off and fold it up and put it in a drawer. Um, I think one of the interesting things that I had to adjust to was realizing that on any given Saturday when I am at King Supers in my sweatpants and my bedhead, that for sure that's going to be the moment that a 2L from DU is going to oh. come up to me and say, Justice Marcus, you know, like, <laughs> you're my hero. <laughs> and I'm just like trying to buy some bananas. Or something. <laughs> that's it. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of thing happens. And you just, you, you do have to monitor yourself. I mean, you have to yeah. be conscious and aware that, um, even on Saturdays and on the weekends, you're still a judge. Uh, you don't get to stop being a judge. As we wind down, we want to be sure that we have the chance to ask you, what's next for you? What is next for me? So um, obviously the court has a lot on its plate right now mm-hmm. between COVID and just kind of the recent events. Um, we're, we're dealing and wrestling with quite a bit. Um, last August, uh, if we think about just the challenges of COVID and then all of the things that happened over the summer with George Floyd and the Mm -hmm. demonstrations and social upheaval and um, I think heightened awareness around so many issues has prompted a lot of conversations on our court. The other thing that happened was with Justice Coates' departure, um, we had had a system in place of choosing our chiefs where the chief once chief stayed in that role until he or she retired. For some, that meant just a couple of years. For others, like Chief Justice Malarkey, that was a long time. Mm -hmm. After Chief Justice Coates left, we looked around the room and realized we were all basically the same age, and none of us is particularly close to retirement. And we decided we didn't want to be in a position where the next chief would be the chief for 15 or 20 years, maybe. So we decided to opt to a rotation system, Mm -hmm. and we decided to go ahead and announce two and keep the term short. So Chief Justice Boatwright is starting. I will be following. Um, At the time we made that announcement, I don't think we could have predicted everything that has happened here in 2021. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, it has actually worked to our benefit. Um, Chief Justice Boatwright, of course, is focused on handling a lot of the day-to-day issues, um, both in terms of dealing with COVID, reopening the courts, and that kind of yeah. thing. Uh, I am working very much behind the scenes, trying to address some of these other issues that are brewing. And we've worked really, really well together. And we have made any number of appearances and had conversations with folks at the legislature and elsewhere in the community laying our character on the line saying we are going to deal with these problems we're gonna you know our legacies are staked on it so making change yeah Yeah, we need to work on some culture change Uh, we're aware of that and we're doing a lot of work now behind the scenes around training around um reporting around um potential changes to the code of judicial conduct uh you know, just a, a number of, of things that we need to be working on. But uh, we're super committed to getting it right. So making the profession as well as the community better is what's next for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, we just, we have, we have a lot of work to do. And we're going to link arms and get it done. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Justice Marquez, for being with us. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. It's been a real pleasure to me, for me, too. Thank you so much for this project. It's it's really wonderful. Like I said, I, I look forward to uh, loading the next one into my <laughs> uh, phone and walking my dog and listening to another community member's stories. It's going to be great. It's amazing having you here today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This has been Our Voices. For more information on today's guests or to get involved, please check out the CBA podcast page at cobar.org slash podcast. That's C-O-B-A-R dot org slash podcast.
this podcast series was created by members of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. This podcast is a collaborative effort of the EDI Joint Steering Committee messaging team, including Bonnie Schreiner, Mallory Hasbrook, Mo Watson, Mallory Revel, Linda Moss, Mario Trimble, Nicole Sparaza, Courtney Holm, Emmy Lopez, Charles McGarvey, and Heather Folker. Our recording engineer is Rick Pontelion of Lionsbridge Recording. Our co-producers and editors are Courtney Holm and Nicole Sparaza. Communications director is Charles McGarvey. And this podcast is made possible with the support of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. On behalf of all of us, thanks for listening to Our Voices. Our Voices.